All right, let's begin Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. Left off at verse, let's see, 10. Uh, so fresh review real quick. Remember Abraham, uh, Abram, so his name is still Abram, not Abraham yet. Abram, he uh, did not stay where the Lord wanted him to stay in the land of promise. It was a small little compromise. He kept going on toward the south. And then I've taught you at verse 10, that's why he ended up in Egypt. He didn't just end up in Egypt like that. How it started was at verse 9. He uh, was away from the place where God wanted him to be. And that's how sin usually starts, right? You go away from where God wants you to be, where you should stick to. And then if you go closer and closer toward the direction of sin then you end up in there. So then in Egypt, that's why he ended up there. And it was during a time of famine. It was very grievous in the land. So that's why he stayed in Egypt. So what happened uh, consequently is that it went from bad to worse. Abram not only uh, stayed in the land of Egypt, which is not a good place, which he is outside of God's will for doing that, and he is sinning. Not only is he living in a place of sin, now he's committing sin. And the sin he committed was about his wife, Sarai. So remember, Sarai, she was married within Abraham, uh, Abram's family. So she is not Abram's sister, but half-sister, if you might recall, because it comes from one of uh, Terah's wives, because Terah had multiple uh, wives. So Abram, what he wants to do is that instead of saying that Sarai is his wife in Egypt, he wants to make her instead his sister. Now you might say, why is that? The reason why is because his wife Sarai was apparently a very beautiful woman. And because she's a very beautiful woman, he's worried that they might kill him and take his wife. Now Sarai, she was up in years at that time. But because she was such a beautiful woman, Abram was worried and concerned that his life might be taken and they might steal his wife. If you look at verse 11... And it came to pass, so that's a metaphorical expression that you've learned by now, <clears throat> that it means like what happened later on, once he was in Egypt, when he was come near to enter into Egypt, so actually in this passage it says he was near entering Egypt. So then Abram had a lot of things going on in his mind. He was like, oh, they're going to kill me, they're going to get my wife. He says here that he said unto Sarai his wife, so he's now going to tell Sarai, his wife, behold now, so basically that's an English expression may, uh, meaning, hey, look. So, hey, look, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. So that's self-explanatory. Abram's saying, I know you're a very fair, beautiful woman to look at. Therefore, it shall come to pass. So what's going to happen as a result when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, so once the Egyptians, the people in Egypt, see you, they're going to say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. So they're going to, once they look at Sarai, they're going to say, oh, that's his wife, and they're going to kill Abram, and then, but they're going to say Sar Sarai alive. Say, I pray thee. So Abram wants Sarai to say this. And I pray thee basically is like, I'm begging you. I'm beseeching you. I'm requesting you. That's what pray is. Thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake. So Abram saying that, say that you are my sister so it can go well with me. And when it goes well with me, it's also going to be done uh, for your sake, it's done for your uh, benefit. So he's trying to kind of insert a little bit of pressure over there that, 
hey, it's going to be beneficial for you. You don't want a dead husband, right? You don't want me to die, right? So say that you're my sister. Now, that's a really lame thing to do. I mean, imagine your husband that you fall in love with say, hey, tell them you're my sister so that if they take you away and then you happen to be another man's wife, it can go well with me. And this is done for our benefit. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see your wife get happy after that, right? No, she won't be happy after that, obviously. So notice that her husband is not the knight in shining armor defending his woman, but rather just giving up his woman away like a coward. So that's not a really, uh, you can see right here that Abram is not an ideal man, ideal husband. Imagine this is the guy who's the father of many nations. So the devil got him to bow, got him to cower in fear. A, great, a man of great faith, remember. This is supposed to be a man of great faith. But now look at him falter and become very little in faith. It's uh, very sad. It's very strange why that happened. Okay, um, can you check up, up outside? I saw flashing lights, brother. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. So, uh, anyways, uh, when, we, uh, when we continue on with this passage, Sarai is, uh, and Abram, they're in a very bad pre predicament. The question in our minds now is this. The question in our minds is, why would Sarai, who is up in years... So she is up in years here, yet it is very strange that a woman being up in years, that Abram would think that out of all the women, that the Egyptians, he believes that the land of Egypt itself, that the Egyptians would want his wife. So that's pretty strange and that's pretty uh, troubling to Abram. Why is that the case? It's pretty strange. I mean, there's a lot of younger women, so to speak, and there's got to be beautiful women in Egypt, too. Uh, you do know that the Israelites, they had a problem with that. They always intermingle with the Egyptians. So it's not to say that Egyptian women were ugly. So then why is it then that Abram is concerned about his situation? There are only two possible explanations, one is, uh, or three, actually. So there are three uh, that can explain why Abram would have this fear before he entered Egypt. One is pretty apparent that his wife is very beautiful, so that's one. However, Abram didn't have this fear when he was back in Haran or Ur of the Chaldees, right? So then there's something about the terrain of Egypt that makes it different. So then one Sarai is extremely beautiful, we do know that much. A second thing about a, a, as we keep adding on right here, another thing about Sarai, his wife, is that he's in a different culture and different territory, you have to understand. So being in a different culture and a different territory, then if you bring a person who's like a, uh, from a different culture, different appearance, different look, into a different land, it means different taste. Now, this is sad, but this is actually very true. The problem uh, with people who uh, have sexual pleasure, and Egypt was infamous for that, about sexual pleasures, is that uh, you like different tastes. So that's what sin does. It's not like you're stuck in one and you're content. You go down to a different taste. You like something unique and different look. See, so that's the problem with Egypt. Another thing about Egypt is a no-brainer right here. Remember, it goes all the way back to something strange. Remember when we covered the generations about the Nephilim who later came out and then sexual issues that came out? Remember Genesis chapter uh, 10 that we've covered about Ham's nation, Ham's lineage? He did something funny with Noah. So I've showed you verses on that one. Now, the problem with this, and that's why you parents have to be very careful with your testimony, children watch what parents do. And children will do, carry a mile from what parents carry a couple inches, if you understand what I mean. So then, Egypt, they come from Ham, obviously, from their father. 
If Ham did something funny with his dad a long time ago, then you can bet your bottom dollar it doesn't just end right there and that's the end and, oh, this is where sin stops. It stops with the parent. It's not going to pass along my children. No, that's the problem. That's why you have to watch your testimony. Children see you cuss, parents. They see you lose your temper. And God forbid if something sexual, this is a realistic fact in psychology, especially in something sexual, they will follow your pattern. Even if you got an abusive father. It's really bad. Sometimes there are abusive fathers who do something sexual too, and then the children who sadly receive the abuse, they get, psycho they get psychologically influenced, and then they follow some of its pattern. That's shocking, isn't it? Right? So that's why this second point should be very, very sobering. It's following about the lineage here, about what Ham did. And then not only that, it's about the culture as well in Egypt of that time. It's very sick. Now, the third thing is, now, this is not popular, but you're going to have to admit this because uh, I'll even say this. Even uh, liberal universities admitted this once they started into cultural studies. They even had to admit this. What's going on, I don't know if you've heard of this before, but there's a thing called colorism. Now, colorism is just another word for racism, but what colorism is, is that they judge beauty by color. Now, whether you believe it or not, every, uh, every one of us, whether we like to admit it or not, is racist in some way, or even colorist in some way. All of you can just pretend, no, I ain't a racist, you know, and then stuff like that. No, one thing I've learned, if I'm going to be an honest human being, there is something that is racist within me, and even liberal universities admit that. They'll say that for a person to say that they're not a racist, that's not realistic. So then, it is a, a, it's even interesting that even black activists admit this. So Beyonce's father admitted that the only reason why his daughter, Beyonce, would be beautiful is because she's lighter skinned. So that's a real thing. There is a colorism aspect within human nature. Now, whether you believe it or not, this is, uh, instead of being joyful about whatever color or the shade of skin that we're born with or what God created us to be, it's very sad people are discontent with that. And there is a tendency of that within our mind. So then Asia is pretty bad. I don't know if you knew this, but Asian women, they... Uh, get concerned about darker skin. So there's a thing called bleaching. So they bleach their skin, actually. It's pretty, pretty sad. It's really, really sad. Uh, here's something funny, you know. I could laugh about this because I'm in this unfortunate category. But that for the men who are the least sought after for sexual appeal or for attractiveness is actually Asian men. So me and Jared don't do very well, actually. We're, we're pretty fortunate with who, who we caught, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I did a, uh, you should have saw me at the university. I did a saw presentation about us Asian men, you know, because I was representing the Asian culture. I was like, I know, I, I lose appeal and it's so sad, you know. <laughs> You know, trying to get the women to go, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, I date you or something like that, you know. It's so fun playing the victim card, you know. <laughs> so fun playing the victim card, you know. I think that the people, who, the, the activists that just go out are just hypocritical. They like it because it just gets, gives them attention, you know, <laughs> gives them attention, you know. But uh, anyway, uh, there's, a, there's some truth in that, but anyway... Yeah, you know I'm right, because you white people are the ones writing on your school application, I'm a six-color Native American over here, you know. Or you try to find some European country that's tribal, so that you can use that tribal name, and so that you can, don't use the white word, you know, but that, you know, I'm Viking, you know, or something like that, you know. I'm Visigoth, you know, or something. So that why? So that you can get special privilege in the school, you know. Yeah, uh, you know, I kick very hard on that one. It's a joke nowadays. But it is true. That's what people are going for now. They're all playing the victim card. So then nowadays, you live in a day that people lack responsibility, but play victim and want somebody to take care of them. Oh, this is the kind of government you want. You got it. A socialist government. You're welcome. 
You're welcome. Okay, but anyway, back to the point is there's an element of this one too. So this is matter of fact because even today it's carried on. If it's been carried on even today, racism, colorism, you betcha law in the ancient period, it was worse. <laughs> it was worse back then. So then because of that, that's why Abram, when he came to this land, he had that tendency in his mind, they're going to get my wife. They're going to get my woman. So then just tell them, you're my sister. And like a very good wife, a submissive wife, she said, I'm his sister. <laughs> but I'm sure she was very angry at Abram. I don't know what happened, but... But we can see right here that at verse 13 that Abram was not the man that he should have been for his wife. So this is his shameful sin that the Holy Spirit recorded. If there's a sin that you men don't want to be known as, it's this one right here. That you're a coward to your wife. <laughs> That's pretty shameful and embarrassing actually right here. It's one thing that you talk about anger issues, you know, about men having anger issues, you know. We men will admit that, but then to be like a coward and giving up your woman and letting somebody else take your woman? That's really shameful. Uh, here's the worst part. So in verse 13, believe it or not, this is the wording where you get for your song, it is well with my soul. <laughs> Notice right here at verse 13, let me repeat it again, it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. See that? So you see, the, this is, so you can say Horatio Spafford probably got his inspiration from Genesis 12, 13. So. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I don't think that went on in his mind. But we can see right here, it is uh, the phrase, it is well with my soul. It's a common English expression then. Yeah. That's the point. The point is, it is well with my soul is a common English expression which is why Horatio Spafford used that in his hymn. And then when they translated it to English, they translated it in this manner, and as well with my soul. So Abram said that he will live because of Sarai saying that, uh, Sarai lying for him. So that's the interpretation. Now notice it says my soul, not me, right? That's returning back at the beginning of Genesis 12, where the Bible talks about Abram brought souls along with him. So this establishes the fact that soul does not mean in this passage right here what you're thinking about, like your, your soul that's inside your body and then uh, it's going to survive and live. No, the soul is eternal. We know that. So it's different. Right here, the soul is very simple. Notice right here, he doesn't say that I will live because of thee. He says soul. Why? What does that mean? That means soul means I at the same time. So that proves what you've learned previously, what I've taught you. The real you is who? The soul. So then, that's referring to the real person. That's why in psychology, study of the soul, they do study a lot about your biological functions, but it's more so the mind, right? And for those of you who studied about the soul before, they attribute the mind to the soul. Why? That's talking about the real person, the real you. Not this outer shell, but the real you. So in a sense right here, soul and the real person, it matches together. The real soul that's inside your body, it does mean me at the same time. So they match together. So they match together. So basically, Abram is saying that I will live if you do this. Okay? That's what he means when he's talking about the soul. He's talking about the real person. Now then, the question is, that's what Jehovah Witnesses use as the passage. They will use this to say that, see, the soul is referring to your body. So when the body dies, the soul dies, or they'll call it soul sleep. They don't believe that the soul is eternal. Now, that's not true because notice in this passage, let's look at Genesis chapter 30.
5, 35, we're going to look at Genesis 35. Now notice right here that the soul does not die when a person dies. When a person dies, the soul is something that's real inside you that can leave the dead body. It doesn't stay in there and fall asleep like Jehovah Witnesses would like to teach. Looks, look at Genesis chapter 35. Notice that the Bible reads at verse 18, And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she what? Died. So when Rachel was dying, her soul was leaving, you'll notice. Now look at uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Matthew 10 Verse 28, so the soul is referring to the real person, and yet at the same time, we have to understand it is something that is eternal. It does not mean body, so we have to understand that. It does not mean body. That's a big no-no right here. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. And fear not them which kill the body. See that? But are not able to what? Kill the soul. So the soul is not part of the body, you have to understand. So they're separate. They're separate. All right, let's go back to Genesis. 12. Genesis chapter 12. We're going to look at verse 14 now, verse 14. The Bible says, and it came to pass, so if Moses is the author, I guess he likes to keep using it came to pass, it came to pass, like every two verses. And it came to pass that when Abram was come into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. So uh, again, this is word for word explanation through the book, uh, through verse-by-verse -verse Bible studies. So I'm going to do that. That way you can get a common sense gist of understanding every word that you're reading in the Bible. So basically, uh, Moses is pointing out, uh, what happened later on is that when Abram came inside Egypt, Egyptians saw the woman, Sarai, that she was beautiful. Verse 15, the princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh. Well, that's pretty huge then. Sarai really got the attention. So Abram, he was right in his hunch at the beginning. So Sarai definitely was quite a looker. In verse 15, it caught the attention of the princes of Pharaoh now. So then they saw her, then they commended, recommended Sarai to Pharaoh. So then what did Pharaoh want? Yeah, he wanted to marry her. Now look at the process, which is interesting. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. So look at this. Sarai was brought inside Pharaoh's house. Uh, you'll notice right here, verse 16, and he entreated Abram well for her sake. So Pharaoh treated Abraham very well because of Sarai. So usually, obviously, men do that. They treat the family member well if they like the woman. So what did Pharaoh do? He gave him, and he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. So Abram, he received sheep, he received cattle, he received uh, male donkeys, that's what it means, he asses, and men servants, so male servants, maid servants, female servants, female donkeys, and then uh, and camels. All right, so that's the idea, or a mule. But whatever. If we go back to verse 16 and 15, this is an important phrase showing that Pharaoh did not marry Sarai yet. Okay, what's going on over here is that it's. Uh, engagement process here going on in Egypt. Now, how do we know this? The first clue is given when you look at verse uh, 16, at verse 16. 
because when you uh, read about the rules of getting married or engagement, what happens is when the person is a, in the book of Deuteronomy, it shows when the person's going to get married, he's receiving a dowry. He's receiving a gift. Uh, one preacher, it was pretty funny. He was poking fun at one uh, Christian who tried to be so scriptural that, yeah, when, we get, when I get my daughter married, you know, I go by the Bible. He's like, oh, really? He's like, yeah, we're going to go, we go by the Bible. So when one of my children get married right here, and I'm going to give my daughter away, I go by the Bible, what the law of Moses said. And then the preacher said, okay, so if my son marries your daughter, you're going to give me a dowry, right? And then the guy's like, huh? <laughs> and the preacher said, no, I'm supposed to get a dowry, some gift for this, you know, where's the gift? <laughs> so... But that's what it was during that time. You notice that there? So when one person's getting another person, then he's supposed to uh, receive gifts. So we can see right here, it's not officially married yet, but that it's going through a marriage process. A second clue, which is pretty big, is that the woman is taken into royal, the house of royalty. Now, for some of you who don't know, in ancient times, when a royal king wanted to marry a woman he had a harem of women uh, and a house so then if there's a woman that he likes inside that harem of women he gets his choice so let's look at the book of esther chapter 2 we look at esther chapter 2 Notice that in the kingdom of Persia right here, how Ahasuerus was able to marry Esther was that Esther had to go through this marriage or engagement process. So it was a process that she had to go through. Esther chapter 2. Notice at verse... Eight. So it came to pass when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan the palace, to the custody of Haggai, that Esther was brought also unto the king's house. So notice that's the same thing as Genesis 12, the wording. The woman is brought to the king's house, right? But look what happens, what, what that means when you're brought to the king's house to the custody of Haggai, keeper of the plural women. So there's a house, a harem of women over there. <clears throat> and the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him, and he speedily gave her her things for purification. See that? A purification process. Uh, you can compare that with the marriage supper of the lamb judgment seat of christ but that's a separate study we're not going to do that okay that'll be pretty interesting there like when god raptures you to his house there's a process but anyways uh, that's just a sign that's just a bonus all right y'all y'all do your own studies with such things as belong to her and seven maidens which were meet to be given her uh the king's house man you can teach some doctrine there but let's continue on and he preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the house of the women. Notice there. Notice at verse 12. Now when every maid's turn was come to go into King Ahasuerus, after that she had been where? How long? Twelve months according to the manner of the women. See, so you got that much time inside the house where you don't get married yet. So Sarai wasn't in, was not in the dangerous moment of marrying Pharaoh yet, where Pharaoh had sexually touched her yet. So she was protected. Um, keep reading on here. <clears throat> Verse 13, Then thus came every maiden unto the king. See, so everyone's going through a turn, so there's a harem of women. Verse 14, she goes to the second house of the women. So it's not just one house. Once you enter inside the house, you can go to the next house, down to the next house, and then et cetera, et cetera. So we see right here that uh, this is very similar uh, with uh, Genesis 12. 
verse 15, Esther obtained the most favor out of all the women. At verse 15. All right, let's go back. Genesis 12. All right, so Sarai had time, and probably she was praying very hard. Lord, I do not want to marry this man. I bet you she was praying harder than Abram. You know, Abram was probably thinking, oh, I already gave up my wife a long time ago. And Sarai, and Sarai is like, Lord, I do not want to marry this man. My husband's a horrible man, great man of faith. People, people, people always go to my husband after church. That's a great sermon, Pastor. You're a great man of great faith. And yet, I know what kind of a coward and that man is. He don't even pray, this guy, giving up his own wife. All right, so I can say all this because she's not here, so I can say all this. All right, let's go to verse 17. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house. Yeah, no, yeah, I'm sure he did. So the Lord sent plagues upon Pharaoh and his house with great plagues. So these are severe plagues that Pharaoh and his kingdom received because of Sarai, Abram's wife. Based, now notice the wording here. Based on what Pharaoh did with Sarai. Okay, if it's based on that reason why the plague came, would Pharaoh know that reason? Yes, because look at verse 18. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Okay, so that's self-explanatory. Pharaoh called, summoned Abraham, Abram, told him, What did you do to me? What is this thing that you did to me? Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? So Pharaoh knew. Okay, this is interesting then. Go to Romans 2. Here's the infamous question that you hear ignorant, educated, PhD idiots saying, what about the heathen who don't know? Heathen have more brains than PhD idiots. Or if PhD idiots can't recognize God because education was the one that taught them out of God, See, only education would make you more stupid. Amen. But then heathen people who are out in the middle of nowhere and uh, who don't know much, and then they're not yet deceived by an education system, can realize about there is a God or something spiritual. They've got uh, educated idiots don't have to worry about the heathen. They should be more worried about themselves. What about the heathen that don't know the gospel? No, you ought to be more worried about yourself because your education blinded you from a God, whereas the heathen, they at least have knowledge of God. So notice right here that we got heathen people here who under Pharaoh knew it was God and that he was punished for a sin he committed. So notice right here that the Pharaoh, that he pretty much got a, the gospel better than a bunch of Id idiotic educated people today. He realized that what his action was sinful, but he did was wrong. He know he's a sinner and that it's a crime against a creator and that against the divine creator, there is punishment for that. And the last thing, this Pharaoh, this heathen seeks for salvation. What does salvation mean? To be saved from punishment. So Pharaoh got fearful he wants to be saved from the punishment well look at this this pharaoh got the gospel better than four thousand years later a bunch of phd idiots amazing let me tell you something this ain't no secret phd idiots know the gospel too they just like to pretend and deny and push it away they know they know the gospel better than pharaoh they knew that Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected. Pharaoh didn't even know that. How about that? So don't give me this uh, garbage. Look at Romans 2. If they never heard the gospel clearly, don't worry. They have a conscience in there that is aware about sin and some form of salvation. And it may not be perfect or clear to them, but if they follow the best according to their conscience on sin and salvation... God will accept it. You'd be surprised how much God would intervene. 
Didn't he intervene right here? Yeah, he intervened right here. He intervened. He prevented Pharaoh from committing a greater sin. Look at Romans 2. Notice verse 14. For when the Gentiles, Pharaoh, heathen, which have not the law, do by nature. See, that's a na human nature. Uh, things contained in the law. These having not the law are a law unto themselves. See that? Yeah. Notice that verse 13. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the what? Do Doers the of the law shall be what? Justified. justified. See, they're justified. God will justify them. All right, go back. Genesis 12. Notice how abstract verse, this is so important for you. 17, 18, 19 is abstract. He didn't get like some gospel presentation clearly or a one-hour preaching. It is so abstract here, but yet he had knowledge and he knew enough. All right? You preach one hour at PhD idiots, clearly they still don't get it. Yeah, I kicked them very hard for some of you who don't know. All right? I have to the number one group of people I disrespect more than prostitutes, than more than uh, criminals, is educated PhD idiots who pretend to be innocent and smart and know it all, and they're the good guys. Because at least criminals know that they know what they did was wrong. All right, anyway, back to the point at hand. That's why I disrespect Calvinists. I know, I'm parking it there, all right? All right, I'm sorry, but I have to do this. Why, why do I disrespect Calvinists so much? People say, I don't, I watched Gene Kim too with John MacArthur, Paul Wash, all these guys, holy men of God, very pious. That upsets me more. Jesus is more upset with pious religious people more who should know better, but use that to take advantage of people and teach them something wrong and deceive them. All right, I disrespect that more too. I'm very sorry. Their piety might fool you suckers, but it don't fool me. Do you understand that? So I ain't going to put on a show and be all pious with you onliners. Okay? I ain't going to do that and deceive you and fool you. What a great guy. Who loves Jesus? Such a humble man. I ain't going to put on a show. All right? If I'm going to be angry, I'm going to show you my angry face. If I'm going to be honest, I'm going to be honest. If I'm going to critique, I'm going to critique. All right? I'm going to be real with you. All right? And if you don't like that, then sorry. Then if you like to enjoy being the sucker with some guy who smiles at you and says, we're doing this to protect you. We're doing this for your safety. And we're doing this because we care about people. And those people out there who critique what I'm doing are mean people, are nasty people. That's why you get stuck in that kind of a system today. And you're all suckers for that one, man. You like to be a sucker, be my guest. All right, uh, I'm not going to, I don't want to park it. Okay, let's go. Verse, uh, I read 18, thank you. Now we're in 19, right? Why saidest thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her uh, to me to wife. So Pharaoh said, why did you say she's your sister? I would have taken her as my wife then. So that shows, see, he didn't marry yet. He was going through an engagement process, okay? Now, going through that engagement process, uh, Pharaoh says, now therefore behold thy wife. <laughs> so you can see he's mad at Abram. Okay, so look at right here. Okay, so now here's your wife, okay? Your wife. <laughs> Take her and go thy way. So take her and get out of here, right? <laughs> and Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. So Pharaoh commanded his people, obviously, about Abram and the wife. So don't touch them. Leave them alone. Make sure they get out of here. He sent uh, Abram away, the wife away, and everything that Abram had away as well. So he sent them away. We can see that this process is repeated with the children of Israel when they left the land of Egypt, when they were free from bondage. When the Egyptians have a disdain on these people, they have a tendency to send not just the people away, but everything they have away. So this might explain how the Lord finally got Pharaoh to kick out uh, the, the Jews and to, 
to let the Jews take all their stuff away. If you recall at the book of Exodus, Pharaoh wanted some of their stuff to be left behind. So God's like, oh, so you really want that? I'll teach you a lesson, Pharaoh. Took away his firstborn child. That made Pharaoh finally get so much disdain with anything that has to do with the Jewish people that he said, you take everything away and get out of here. Why? Because God knows human nature. He said, oh, Pharaoh, I've seen your ancestors do that a long time ago. So I know what's going to get you kick those Jews out. I'm going to do that again. If there's one thing, you don't want God to do that. You'd better sooner repent than the Lord have you repent, trust me. Because when he makes you repent, it costs a high price. Why? Because you got so much flesh and pride in you that God knows that in order for you to bend and kneel, you have to go with your teeth busted. Because that's the only way that you finally bend the knee, unfortunately. All right. Verse 1, 13, verse 1. <clears throat> and Abram went up out of Egypt. So Abram, he uh, left Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had. So Abram left Egypt, himself, his wife, and everything that he owned. And Lot with him into the south. Lot also uh, with him when they went south. Now, notice right here, there are two things to note. One is, notice at the passage, Lot with him. So when Abram left Egypt, when he departed from Egypt, the Holy Spirit wrote Lot with him. There's something important there. Why is it that the Bible would mention about Lot when leaving Egypt? There's a second to note over here, which is pretty interesting. Look at later on, verse 10, verse 10. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the what? Land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Now that's very important to note right there. What's important to know here, when Lot was looking uh, as Sodom and Gomorrah, he looked at it like it was like beautiful, like Egypt. Okay, that's an important note. Then that points out right here, Lot loved Egypt. Why? Egypt, if you remember in your Bible, it's a typology of what? The world. All right, if you're a saved believer, you ever heard of a thing called a worldly Christian? What does that mean? You love the world. So if you're not spiritual for the Lord, then not a spiritual Christian, you become more of a worldly Christian, right? So that's Lot's issue. Lot, obviously, because he wasn't spiritual, like Abraham in the faith, what's the alternative option? There's only one. Whether you like it or not, you have two natures, and you have to stick to one, all right? There's no middle ground or something where you can get away from both. No, you either become spiritual or fleshly. That's it. You have a fleshly nature that is attracted to the world. So then you become a worldly Christian. Lot is the greatest example of a worldly believer or a worldly Christian. So obviously he loved the world like Egypt. There is also a possibility, an interesting theory here, which I can go for. It's also possible Lot got his wife in Egypt. You might say, why is that? Because when you look at Genesis 19, turn over there. This is very interesting. It, uh, we'll cover this later on, but if you know your passage, Lot's wife, she looked back at Sodom. She didn't keep, uh, she didn't avoid her eyes away from Sodom, Lot, he knew the trouble with his eyes when he looked at Sodom at the beginning, got him into trouble to begin with, got him to move over there. So then, because of that, look at Genesis 19. Uh, let's see right here. Uh, verse 26, thank you so much. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. So she looked back at where? Look at verse 25. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain 
and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. Okay, looking back at Genesis 13, 10. Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, well watered everywhere like the land of Egypt. See that? So notice the wording right here. Undoubtedly, Sodom was beautiful like Egypt. And there is a reason why Lot's wife would look behind her and look at Sodom. Why would she be attracted to Sodom? Why would she want to look at it again? Why would she go, oh, there goes the furniture, there goes the beautiful garden that I had and all the beautiful things that I had in Sodom. Why in the world would she do that if it looked like Egypt, Sodom? So then it shows right here a possibility. I'm not saying it's a fact, but it's a possibility that it reminded her of her homeland. So she moved out of Egypt because of Abram and Lot. I can't go back to my homeland anymore because of your stupid uncle, Lot. Because of your stupid uncle. I got kicked out. I should have married you. I hated you. And then Lot, he sees Sodom. Wow, it looks like Egypt. That's going to make my wife happy. Me and my wife are going to be happy. So then he goes over there and the wife gets happy. Oh, that's just great, you know. Oh, it just looks like my home country. I'm starting to love this place. I still hate you and your uncle, but... You know, I love this place so much, and that's the reason why I st I'll stay here with you. And then their daughters are getting married, so then the mom's happy, you know. Oh, my, my daughters are going to marry a bunch of sodomites. I'm so happy over here. And <laughs> Lord took care of those sodomites at the end, right? Yeah, that's scriptural. <laughs> yeah, that is scriptural right there. <laughs> but you see right over here that um, uh, there are some humorous things in there, but a lot of it is very true about today, don't we? Uh, it is very true about today. So uh, we can guess right here that Lot got his wife over there. But here's something else that's very interesting. Uh, where did uh, Abram uh, get uh, the trouble? If you get the trouble with seed, God's seed, it's so interesting that it had to do with Egypt. One was Pharaoh would have ruined the seed if he intermingled with Sarai. That's one. Secondly, uh, Lot's children became the enemies of Israel. So Israel got, their sea got threatened by Lot's children. Why? From a wife who may have come from Egypt. Third thing, you don't get an Egyptian slave, Abram, named Hagar, Egyptian. Egyptian, where did he get that? When he was in Egypt. And then came out Ishmael, and then we get the mess that we get today. See, all comes from Egypt. Egypt messes everything up. And let that be a lesson to you people when you start to go toward Egypt. Yes, all that mess happened. It's not like, you know, so I know what you Christians think. Like, you know, you think about, if I skip church once, I, it's not like, you know, that my next generations are going to kill each other. What are you talking about? You're taking it dr to too dramatically. You don't realize the devil is a dramatic person. He pushes sin to the extreme. Yes, he's a dramatic person. He would like for you to take one bite out of the fruit so that there can be disease, famine, murder, and yeah, 50,000 generations die out. See, that's your problem. Your problem is, is that you, 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 you human beings are so, let me just say this, you're all too stupid, all right, and that includes yours truly, that when we do some kind of action that's sinful, and we're like, it's not really that sinful, it's not like I'm going to kill out my next generation, you're exaggerating, you're dramatizing something, you've got to understand this, that's what sin does. The devil is a dramatic person, sin is a dramatic thing. Yes, just going a little bit toward the south, Abram, We'll get you into Egypt and cause you all this mess. So what did Abram do? The ver uh, go back to Genesis 13. Notice uh, the second part I want to mention here. He went to the south now. So remember at verse 9, right? Abram was going to the south, right? So that means in that promised land where he was in, the land of Canaan, he was going south. But going south, you know what's next. If you keep going, then you'll go to Egypt, right? So then Abram now was going backwards. So he was getting out of Egypt. He's now going back to the south of Canaan. And where is he going? 
verse 2. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and and in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai. Okay, let me explain all those two verses. So Abram became very rich with, uh, with cattle. He got silver and gold, obviously because of what happened at Egypt when Pharaoh gave him all the spoils. He, during his journeys, he, went to the, he returned south of Canaan, but he went back to the place where he should have stayed at the beginning, right? He went back to Bethel, the place where his tent had been at the beginning, which is between Bethel and Hai, and which is another word for Ai, if you recall. So <clears throat> then it is true. Abram should have stayed there at Genesis 12, 8. What was he doing out of there? He's going to st- get back over there anyway. He should have stayed there. So he was in the wrong for leaving Bethel and going southward. And then because he went south, then he went to Egypt. See, he sinned. He should have stayed right over there where God told him to stay. And I've showed you verses where that was a place where God told him to stay, where God promised him. So there was no doubt when he went to Egypt, he was outside of the will of God. This is something encouraging. If you look at verse 2, Abram, he became very wealthy. He became very rich, right? So how did he become very wealthy and rich? During his backslidden years in the world. Now, look at that right there. Isn't that um, uh, an example of God's mercy and grace? An example of God's mercy and grace is that Abram was outside of God's will by leaving his homeland, by leaving his place where he should have stayed, serving God, being in his will, and he went into the world. And then uh, he lost his faith, and he was even giving up his own women. That's how low you will go when you go into sin. So he gave up even his own woman to a, foreign pers- uh, to a foreigner over there. But then what happened is that the Lord nevertheless blessed him when, and when he returned back to his homeland. So yes, Abram suffered consequence, but he still received God's blessing. So look at Hebrews 12. That's an example of God's mercy and grace on you. Now, I'm sure most of you are a witness and can agree with me that when you got outside of God's will and when you were backslidden, that, yeah, there were consequences, but God nevertheless blessed you. That's an example. Look what God does with chastisement. When God chastises you, notice at verse 11, now no ch- uh, Hebrews 12:11. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable what? Fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way but let it rather be healed. Now notice that your God is a merciful, gracious God. So this is a very encouraging passage where it comforts you about the sin that you committed, that God says the punishment or chastisement is the more proper word here, that chastisement is for your benefit and you get benefits out of it. All right, so that should be encouraging. Go back to Genesis. So Abram he nevertheless still got blessed. Genesis 13, verse 4. So when he went back to his home place, unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first. So remember at Genesis 12, the first time when he went there, at that place where it was between Bethel and Hai, he built an altar he made there at the first. That's what it means at the beginning. He made there. So he did that again. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. So Abram got back into fellowship with the Lord, got right with God and started praying to the Lord again. That's what call on the name of the Lord means. I've showed you that one. People who try to teach you otherwise don't know their Bible. Okay. Verse five. And Lot also, which went 
with Abram had flocks and herds and tents. So verse 5 is pointing out that Lot also, who went with Abram back to the homeland, had a lot of riches as well. He had flocks, herds, and tents, so he became prosperous too. And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together. For their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. So notice right here that the land of Canaan is not able to bear them. So it's not able to put up with the increase of Lot's possessions and Abram's possessions. That's what it means. And the rest of the verse already explained that part for me. For their substance was great so that they could not dwell together. See, so their substance, their possessions, their, all their belongings was so big and great that they could not stay together. They could not live together. So it was overcrowding. Their flocks, their cattle were being confused with each other. They didn't know who's belonging, which one's to who's belonging. It's like you move into your, uh, with your roommate at the Bay Area. That happens to everybody at the beginning. And then the worst thing that can happen is, is that your roommate has a lot of stuff and you do too. And then pretty soon you start fighting with each other after that, right? And we will end it right here, okay? Because the next, my favorite comment teaching was seven and eight and nine, actually. Uh, but I'm not able to cover that today. But th it's another, uh, but this passage is another teaching, which I never thought of before. One of the most important basic doctrinal teachings that I ever taught was fellowship and separation. So there are limits of separation, but over here would have given another great teaching on that one that I never thought of before, and I'll show it to you the next Sunday. I can't wait to show you. It's very eye-opening. It's going to be helpful for you because sometimes in the minds of us Bible believers, it's why are there so many differences amongst us Bible-believing preachers, right? Why is it that we can't fellowship as and be as close as we want to be? This passage will be very helpful on that one, all right? And it's not to say that, uh, that one party is in the wrong, the other party is in the right, or that both parties are wrong. It could be both parties are right about something, but there still should be separation, all right? So I'll teach you that one. It's going to be very eye-opening and helpful. All right, let's close. Father God, I pray that today's teachings have been a blessing to the hearers, uh, dismiss us now with your blessing. And I also want to pray that we've grown more in the scriptures and understood more of your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.